Hey, we're really lucky this afternoon uh, to have um, Catherine Short and uh, Tony Craig here uh, from, from Terra Moana Limited, TML. Catherine, uh, I was given a bio for, for Catherine, but I wasn't given one for Tony, and I apologise that, uh, Tony. But Catherine Short is a partner um, in the environmental consultancy, uh, Terra Moana. Uh, TML bridges and designs sustainable solutions with leading primary industry businesses and community initiatives, specialising in marine conservation and sustainable fisheries and seafood, particularly with indigenous communities. I went over and I said to Tony, look, I, I do apologise, I don't have um, a bio for you. And he said, well, I'm a 35-year-old um, seafood industry. And I said, have you been in the industry 35 years or are you 35 years old? I'll let you make that determination when he walks up here on stage. Big round of applause for these two. Cheers. Nama hinui kia koutou. Yep, ko Tony Craig. And I am half of Terra Moana Limited, the other half being my wonderful business partner, Catherine. And I emphasise the word partner because lately Catherine has forgot to use the word business when she's introduced and it's sort of created a fair bit of angst amongst people that, when they're looking. So um, our job is, uh, our research approach was upholding the value of power quota, just a little bit of uh, background, uh, I'll take a lead from Tarmac. I'm a layperson, I'm not a scientist or researcher. I've been in the seafood industry for 35 years in a whole range of representative policy um, business innovation roles. Um, interestingly enough, I heard people talking about cameras on boats in 1996 when I was the business policy manager for the New Zealand Seafood Industry Council. I sat up and said to them all, I said, one day you'll need cameras on your boats to justify your existence in the water. And one of them said, over my dead body, and I'm just waiting to see his death notice shortly in the paper. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so, um, but in, um, where's the button? This one? So, our project is looking at how you uphold the value of and power quota. And so this is the power to fishery. Um, and the reason why I chose this, I was um, 2008 to 2021, I was the chairman of the power to fishery. It has uh, 47, uh, it's 121 tonnes, and it's been that way since 1986. It's 47 quota owners, Māori own a large percentage of the quota, 71.9%. Um, it's got eight dive teams, 17 divers. Um, I like it because it's, it's got a really big geographical reach, and the commercial fishery only exists inside those red markers. And inside those red, red markers was... Um, there are, where most of the fishery occurs, it actually occurs from Matakona in the north to Tarakarai Point in the south. But when, when I got involved in that fishery, I found out there were 28 statistical um, reporting areas in that. And so that, coming from a farming background, said to me, well, maybe we should think of this as paddocks. And how do we manage these paddocks? And what do we know about what is, it, what, what is in those paddocks? So that's why we chose this fishery. And so how do you uphold the, the value of power quota? These are two, these are two very two different fisheries. Power 2, which is on that Wairarapa coast, and Power 7, which is the top of the south, which includes the Marlborough Sounds. Now, the interesting thing about these graphs is that you'll see that Power 2, uh, the one on your left at the top, that TACC has stayed constant for all that time. And uh, so has the catch rates. Whereas in uh, power seven, uh, for a range of reasons, not the least of which probably fishing pressure, but certainly some environmental reasons, you've seen that fishery take some fairly reasonable uh, TACC cuts. The most interesting point is the graphs underneath, which is what is the value reduction on balance sheets of those, of those fisheries. And as you can see on the left, it's relatively stayed stable at $50 million of capital balance sheet value. And on the, on the other side, you've seen it drop from 80 or $90 million down to $30 million, $60 million worth of value right, right, wiped off balance sheet. So how can we avoid that from, from happening? So we really wanted to, the project's aims are to, to get this shared understanding of what environmental uh, and change and uh, are facing this wild power fishery along that coast. And, um, 
and, and what does that mean for our economics, what does that mean for policy decisions of the future, how are we going to collect the data that's going to enable us to make those management decisions on a more real-time, regular basis, and, and adjust to those things where, where the environment's likely to occur. occur. We wanna, we're going to develop this, uh, a business model um, that will have, hopefully have uh, a, an ability to put in levers that can adjust possible scenarios over time, and then um, we'll use this, this model to try and um, uh, to enable better understanding of the impacts coming at us over the future and what, what triggers, what levers we might need to pull to make that happen. You know, um, it's just recently you'll have seen some of the, the stuff that's happening um, on our coastline uh, and, and this is just an example of the sort of stuff that we've got to to start considering in much greater sense of the impacts, the long term, of these things. Yeah, there's, um, we had a meeting yesterday, and um, so what are some of those things that are likely to come at us? Uh, you know, we've got temperature. We know that has an impact, um, particularly uh, when you look at the east coast, Tairawhiti. We we know for years that because that temperature's been uh, a lot warmer than what it is in the Wairarapa coastline, that fish don't grow as quite as um, fast after they reach 80 millimetres, and so you get stunted, what you call, a, in a sense, stunted stock. So the question for us is how long might that temperature take to drift down at the wider upper coast and what might that mean for that fishery? Turbidity, um, uh, suspended sediment into the water, how long it's going to be there, what it's going to do. Um, sedimentation, uh, we've had a recent event on the wider upper coast with the cyclone, which um, some of our fishers have seen some fairly anecdotal uh, evidence of large wash-ups and huge um, sediment loads. In fact, one of the um, rock lobster fishermen I spoke to uh, the other day, he can't use his sounder because there's so much turbidity in the water, it won't work at that moment. So, and then long-term acidification, and then what are the impacts to those on our foods and seaweeds? So. Thanks to um, Dean uh, Spicer and the team at ANZ and uh, uh, providing for us Christine Smith who's built this model. We've, we're building a model that'll try to, try to give us some insight into what are the impacts of climate change will be on this power fishery. It's a simplified methodology from the uh, stock assessment model and what we're trying to do is establish the initial population size of the area and then model that over 20 years taking into account things like recruitment, growth, and um, instantaneous mortality, fishing, and um, uh, et cetera. The, the, as I said, the main part of this model is, is, you know, where does value get driven from? It's the ability to have enough power above the legal size limit in a constant basis to enable you to, ca to have this, the security and understanding that that'll be there to fish year after year. That's what drives value, okay? Um, so that, and then hopefully this model will also look at the climate change expressed through, you know, we can put some diff different scenarios for recruitment success and growth transition and mortality implications. So, so hopefully over time this model will deliver us this tweaking that we can look at and enable us to have so much better information from which to make our decisions about how to manage that fishery. Catherine. Thank you, partner. Um, at, at this point, the, um, the model is a terribly scary spreadsheet. As I um, like to say, I'm not the mathematician in our group, um, Tony and some of the other tremendous people in our team who will, on the final slide, be, be acknowledged are doing that with, with Christine. Um, but it is, as an ecologist, you know, we had our team meeting yesterday, and when we're talking about one impact, um, you could hypothetically say is a 5%, um, uh, in one, one, one environmental stressor you could hypothetically say is a 5% impact on the, on, the, um, on the model, on the scenario. Um, three stressors is probably more like 50%, it's not 15. And, and that's then, you know, the, the whole kaupapa of this project is not to say the sky is falling, which is why the language is, uh, is upholding um, the value of power quota, but to, um, really start to talk about resilience strategies and, in, and investment in those resilience strategies. And, and this is where, when we were invited by Sustainable Seas to begin designing this project, it was really exciting to be able to ring up 
Dean Spicer at ANZ, who we had heard was starting to do some, take some interest in this arena, bankers to 60% of the seafood sector, and fortunately he's, he's on a panel here this afternoon, so you'll be able to hear from him directly. You know, they, they, they want to learn their exposure, and they want to learn their exposure now because of the Zero Carbon Act and the Task Force on Climate Disclosures, TCFD. Some of you may have now also heard about the Task Force on Nature Disclosures. Um, and this is where our um, work also with um, Envirostrat on the Blue Economy Disclosures before Christmas um, started to pull together this, this picture which is actually a, a de-risking pyramid. And the more, the more information you have at that environmental field level, which again from that blue economy work, is, is, it must be collaboratively collected. We can't all afford to be collecting this information for ourselves anymore. The seafood sector can't afford it. The regional councils can't afford it. Central government certainly can't afford it. We need to be collaboratively collecting it and then reporting it up through those um, various corporate accountability frameworks. Um, uh, to demonstrate that we are fulfilling, that we are reducing um, uh, risk. And, and interestingly, conceptually, it starts to shift a lot of the responsibility for those response strategies onto the private sector. So there's a real opportunity in the blue economy to, to come through there, but then you need to go back to my, my long-term background in, in WWF around credible eco-labeling and credible verification systems. And that's quite a challenging space for, for New Zealand. So that's, um, we, we have to produce a final report, obviously, so trying to weave all of this together in this integration for impact um, period of the, of the challenge, um, this will be a, be a useful um, way of synthesizing things. We've got our standard um, flow diagram of the um, map of the, of the project, and now we're, you know, all of a sudden in the last um, few months um, of, of the work. Uh, took a while to get um, up and running, as is always the case, and we had a very sombre team meeting a few weeks ago just after the cyclone was like, whoa, what do we do now? So we are still considering some of the, um, the need for um, uh, local environmental data. Um, uh, it, we missed the baseline, unfortunately. Um, but uh, that's the moi moi that Tony was going to speak to next. And I better not, you know, you, you get into trouble when you steal your partner's thunder, right? So I better move on. Um, yeah, uh, so what was my dream um, running that fishery? At some point, I'd love to have done a comprehensive East Coast Tairawhiti, uh, Hawke's Bay, Wairarapa um, ecosystem based approach to putting a network of sensors in those waterways, t telling us in real time what turbidity rates were, sediment loads, um, salinity, uh, temperatures, all of those things, so that you can get an early detection of what's happening and, and then go out there post events to, to, to look at uh, what's, what's the recovery rate right, what's the recovery times, uh, which we don't have. I, I, took, I rang, um, and two minutes left so I've got time, I rang uh, someone in Dock to talk about the um, um, Blackhead Reserve and when that was destroyed by um, uh, a similar event and it was completely covered, and, and I said, well, who's done the research to tell us how long that took to recover, what was the process, and, and there was nothing done. And so that really is a concern to me and something I'd like to see better in a project like this, that we see the event, we've got a baseline estimate, tragically, um, sadly, the, the cyclones have now happened, and um, we, we can't get that, although we can for the wider upper coast from a sense by using our divers to, to get in the water because they know they've been there all that time and they can, they can observe the change and at least document that. But to tell us, you know, what's happened, how big the event is, what we need to do to make adjustments to management decisions for that year, not that just that year and the recovery time and then what, what it's possible to do in the long term to make the recovery um, sped, sped up. Um, Julie, thanks for the chance for having uh, this on the program. Um, we really, it's new for me and I've really, really enjoyed the work and, um, and thanks to all of the people that are involved um, on our behalf. So. It's a real, a real treat to see everyone in person um, after so many Zooms and um, distant contacts in the last few years. So yeah, thank you very much. Chat, chat to you in the break. Well, um.